Welcome to this year's RSA annual lecture. Today of the forum of the uh, journal Regional Studies Regional Science. It's part of an annual series um, organized by the Regional Studies uh, Association to essentially present some of the most up-to-date research um, that's published in all of the journals of the RSA. The Regional Studies Association is the global and interdisciplinary network for urban and regional research, development and policy. And the Regional Studies Association as a community actually supports uh, its members through a number of research activities, funding schemes, networking, publishing opportunities and spaces to grow research and careers in more general. And as part of this, actually, the Journal of Regional Studies and Regional Science plays a specific role uh, at the heart of uh, the association's um, goals. And one of this is to publish open uh, access as well and to make the research as widely available as possible, but also to offer uh, long term career path support, for example, through the mentoring uh, scheme and the early career mentoring scheme um, of the journal. So if you're interested in this and if you're um, a young academic who's interested to get a little bit of support in the uh, publication process, this may be a route uh, to look at as well. So if you want to uh, join other lecture series, and I'll give an announcement as well as the end of the session today, you can also use the RSA Hub and the RSA News Events Hub. So for today, some housekeeping uh, information first. So this webinar will be recorded and it will be made available on the RSA launch. Um, if you've got any questions, and we hope you've got some questions for an interesting discussion, please put them in the Q&A box. And if you want to tweet and uh, make the discussion more widely available as well on Twitter, you can use, for example, the hashtag RSA webinar or the hashtag RSA journals uh, to tweet about the event. Now, turning to today. So I would like to introduce first today's speakers, Jeff Boeing. He's, uh, he received his PhD in city and regional planning from the University of California, and he's currently an assistant professor of urban planning and spatial analysis, as well as the director of the Urban Data Lab. Before he joined uh, the University of California, he was an assistant professor of urban informatics and planning at Northeastern University at the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs. And what we can see here already is that he very easily bridges the gap between public policy, uh, urban planning in the fields of data sciences. And that is also one of the research fields um, where he kind of links data sciences, urban informatics urban form with city planning. And more precisely, part of this, and I think that's also what we will hear about more today, is the nature and character of urban street networks um, and how spatial technologies uh, and the data actually shape housing markets. So today we'll get to think a little bit about this interrelationship between um, the data that we've got, the technologies that shape them, these data sciences, um, and what we can learn um, from this. The work is widely published and apart from maybe some of you have read more from his uh, academic publication, but it is noteworthy as well to say that his communication capacities and the field, of course, um, has allowed him to be um, widely reflected as well um, in more uh, other newspaper outlets such as Forbes or Slate. Um, and um, it's uh, also quite important to sometimes get some recognition. So I would like to also mention that he got the Information is Beautiful Award in 2018 or in 2019, the NetSci Visualization Award. So uh, we are very honored to be able to listen to your talk today, um, which will be about urban mobility and street network sciences. And without further ado, I would like to hand over to you, Jeff. Hey, thank you, Francesca. I appreciate that kind introduction. Can everybody um, hear and see me okay? Take that as a yes. Let me share my screen here. And um, I have a few slides to share with you this morning or late afternoon, depending on uh, which part of the world you're coming in from. So today uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about urban mobility 
and street network science around this theme of urban informatics. And I want to start off by thanking RSA for this invitation, in particular, Regional Studies, Regional Science. Um, this is a nice opportunity to get to speak on this theme of urban informatics and, and transport. And this theme is kind of near and dear to my heart because of my own background. Um, my undergraduate and master's training were in computer systems and information science. And then I, I got my doctorate in city planning. So I've always kind of straddled this line between um, the informatics world and urban planning, particularly transport planning. And when I started off doing this, I, I was a little bit of an odd duck because it, it wasn't uh, a very standard path to be moving between these fields. But we know, of course, today and over the past decade, that's um, changed drastically. Now there are many master's programs focusing on urban informatics. There are hundreds, thousands of researchers around the world um, every day pouring their energies into this topic. It's just, it's shown enormous growth, both with a lot of improvements, but still with a lot of potential too. So today I wanna to think critically about it, both what it does well um, and what it does poorly. And one more thing about my, my background too, I live in uh, Los Angeles right now. And so the ideas of urban informatics and transport are always um, very important to me. Today, for example, it's about 20 degrees Celsius outside, um, light cloud cover. It's really a, you know, a, a gorgeous fall day, but we all have our windows sealed shut and we will all day today, or we will if we know it's good for us. Um, because over the past four or five days, we've had um, extremely unhealthy levels of air pollution that have been trapped over the metro area by um, the marine layer. It causes an inversion when cold air moves in from um, over the ocean. And we haven't been able to uh, breathe outside because of the amount of particulate matter and ozone that we produce in the city. And our only hope is to have it flushed out. There's obviously an important transportation question here about how we utilize transportation networks, what kind of networks we've built, the way we've chosen to live. <clears throat> so I wanna think a little bit today, unpacking this idea of urban informatics, considering the ways in which it can help us ask questions about these kinds of things and where it doesn't work so well, where the limits of urban informatics are, but where some possible paths forward are. In particular, um, I'd like to think about its links with transport geography and planning in the context of why we study street networks, particularly street network form, which is um, the focus of my own research and what I can speak best to. So I wanna think about the, how street network form creates a connective tissue that underlies urban mobility and in many ways determines our mobility, what we do, how we do it, when we do it, essentially our freedom of mode choice. And then I wanna think about some recent directions in this space. So work by a lot of other folks who've um, done interesting things in recent years at the intersection of informatics and transport networks. And then I'll uh, share a little bit of my own recent work in the space as well. And I wanna conclude with a, a bit of a call to arms. So from those recent directions, I wanna highlight a couple of places where we could really make a lot of impact, both as academics and as practitioners here. So my argument is going to be that a lot of the empirical tools that we use for um, the science of cities at this intersection of information science and, and transport needs better theoretical underpinnings. So relevant theory like geography or, or urban theory to allow us to conduct better science. And my argument here by the end of this talk is that this tool building aspect is a key opportunity today in, in urban informatics and transport to build better knowledge of the world around us and to make more meaningful impact in practice behind some of the low hanging fruit that we often pluck. So to start off here, I wanna talk briefly about what I mean when I say urban informatics. And I would suspect that most folks in this room um, have a, a good idea of, of what that, that topic covers. But like many terms 
in this field, it's very overloaded. Its meanings can be contested and everybody takes on a different flavor, I think, of, of what it means. So for me, um, urban informatics would be applied information science in the urban domain. What that means in practice is that it's multidisciplinary. It brings many disciplines together to let us understand, plan, and manage cities. And it specifically does so by focusing on computing and information technologies. So there are obviously many different ways to understand, plan, or manage cities. Urban informatics is the one that centers computation and information technology. So this field triangulates planning, the spatial sciences, computer science. It obviously has many overlaps with longstanding fields like GIS and statistics, but it also brings in information processing, um, new methods of storage and data wrangling that were often accessory to these other fields, whereas informatics tends to center them at the middle of the toolkit in this field. Of course, these tools and technologies have a, a long history in, in regional science. And in fact, much of the urban informatics discipline can trace its roots directly to innovations in regional science over many decades. But in addition to that intellectual trajectory, there's also been a lot of new work in social physics, urban physics, statistical mechanics, that have given us new models, new tools to try to build urban theory through science. But urban informatics is both a basic science and an applied science. And so what I mean by that is a basic science, it generates new theoretical understandings of the city. So it uses um, computing and information technologies to help us understand cities, come up with principles to explain cities, generalize from our studies to talk about cities and urban living. But beyond a basic science, it's also an applied science. Urban informatics is now central to how many urban operations work. So professional practitioners, city planners, city managers, policy makers use this toolkit that we as academics or corporate enterprises develop to monitor and manage the city as we see here in Rio de Janeiro. On the applied front, <clears throat> urban informatics sometimes takes on promising forms, sometimes more prosaic forms, and sometimes truly pernicious forms. On the promising side, informatics offers us this promise of better understandings of the city, more efficient cities, being able to solve longstanding problems in cities. And this is especially promising if, if we're able to do this in a way that can serve marginalized communities that um, have often been underserved by much of the urban planning and policymaking toolkit. Uh, but we should perhaps be skeptical of that promise because a lot of the time it takes on its more prosaic or pernicious forms where urban informatics instead becomes merely yet another vector of the same old surveillance, control, and policing that we've often seen in forms of urban technology and urban management uh, for centuries. And there are important critiques of, of urban informatics accordingly. So some of those critiques will revolve around the fetishization of method, where um, too often in this field, we'll put the data or the method or the tool ahead of the question or the subject. There are also obviously important concerns about privacy, ethics, and the social justice dimension of widespread surveillance and information technology infusing um, the public realm. Now, that's not the subject of, of my talk today, but I, I do want to acknowledge them, also acknowledge that there are many efforts underway to proactively address them. But there's also an important tension here between the predictive or descriptive teleology of data analysis itself versus the more theory building aims of a science. And urban informatics straddles these fields, straddles these lines, sometimes um, very effectively. Sometimes it, it struggles to do it in a, a more meaningful way. So 
when we intersect urban informatics and, and transport broadly, there are some important strengths specifically here. So it does offer us a better understanding of certain quantifiable phenomena. Emphasis on quantifiable because that's what the, the toolkit and methods do. On the practice side, it offers us dashboards and alerts for better monitoring of cities, quicker interventions. Um, we can understand congestion conditions, institute dynamic tolling and so forth. But on the flip side, where it's strong also entails some limitations and weaknesses. So first off, obviously in the city, not everything is quantifiable. And there's an important question here about, as we rely more and more on these informatics-based toolkits, are we able to ask the right kinds of questions as urban scholars, or does the method circumscribe the questions we can even begin to ask, let alone answer, and the kind of people that we can serve accordingly? And while not everything is quantifiable, there are too often overly grand claims about solving the city in this field. And I think a lot of the time, a little bit of humility um, goes a, a long way. But secondly, and related to this, there's an important question here. Can urban informatics and more broadly, urban science, which very much relies on informatics um, for its data, its empirical methods, can it address the real wicked problems in cities? Or is it truly constrained to the low hanging fruit that it's so often aimed for in its first couple of decades of existence? I wanna talk more about that as, as we go along today, but I think to mitigate some of these weaknesses I've, I've just mentioned, a couple of important points for the future that I'm going to lead up to and talk about it at the end this morning. First off, closing the skills gap is really important. So too often in this space, we either have people who are um, strongly trained in methods coming out of physics programs, computer science programs, data science programs, or we have people who are very strongly trained in urban problems, who are steeped in urban theory or geographic theory or planning theory. But historically, there hasn't been as good of an overlap of these two. So you have people skilled in the methods of informatics. Um, and when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You have people who are steeped in theory and too often our theoreticians aren't the people developing our quantitative methods or our computing tools. Um, because of misaligned incentives or a lack of um, training or interest. So if we can close that skills gap, it'll be an important um, arrow in our quiver for addressing some of these weaknesses. And we're already obviously seeing some important steps toward that today with many new Master of Science programs developing around the world to explicitly do what I was just talking about. But secondly, we also need better data and tools for the empirical science particularly the, the theory building dimensions of um, urban informatics. And that'll be my, my topic to conclude. Um, so I'm gonna leave that there for now, but start by thinking briefly about some of the things that we can tap into here. Because in particular, that idea of tool building and being able to work with new kinds of data, I think is a particular area of promise for transport planning to take advantage of the scientific side of urban informatics. Because so much of urban mobility is explicitly an information problem. Information for the citizen to use about their accessibility, about arrival times, about current congestion conditions, also information for the planner about network utilization or the resilience of the transportation system. This has also been a huge growth area for user generated data, everything from GPS traces to transit card taps to volunteer geographic information, such as OpenStreetMap, um, which I have a, a screenshot of here. Um, in OpenStreetMap, we crowdsource knowledge about the urban form, particularly transport features, um, which has been a, a paradigm shift in a lot of ways for the kinds of research that we can do around transport networks. And that will be my, my focus here for the, the next section. I want to think a little bit more about network form 
So that thing that underlies urban mobility. Um, network form has a lot of implications for the sustainability and, and the performance of our transport systems. And here I want to think less about the applied side of mission control in urban informatics, the people with the, the big dashboards pulling levers in the city planning department, and more on the basic science side of this. So our understanding of cities and the spatial outcomes of their planning through data and technology. And so when I talk about street network form, what I mean is some combination of geometry and topology. That is both the street networks positions, lengths, widths, angles, areas, um, but also it's topology. So it's structure, it's connectivities, it's internal orientations. Street network form underlies um, our mobility in the city, the movement of people, and freight, it creates a physical fabric that connects or very explicitly is designed to segregate different communities. And um, when taken in conjunction with land use and urban design, it determines our accessibility to goods, services, and our daily living needs. And we um, study street network structure because it provides a sort of substrate or, or connective tissue that organize all of our dynamics in urban space. So here um, I have uh, four networks that I use to illustrate this idea of um, the same scale looking very different in terms of pattern, texture, and grain. These street networks all reflect different transport technologies and design paradigms, political contexts, expressions of power, underlying terrain, local culture, and different economic conditions in different places. Um, for example, we can consider the histories and values that are embedded in the classic street grid from Hippodamus's urban design work in ancient Greece to the law of the Indies, the US Homestead Act and New York Commissioner's Plan. The grid has always been used to express human order over the landscape, to organize transports around spaces of power, to make land amenable to real estate speculators, developers. We can contrast that with Haussmann's renovation of Paris in the 19th century, and it's very different planning goals, or the autocentric form of different sunbelt cities in the United States, and the notions of lifestyle, aspiration, privilege, and exclusion that are very explicitly planned into certain kinds of cities and suburbs around the world. So all these street networks demonstrate varying levels of connectedness, accessibility, compactness, resilience, and sustainability. But when we add in building footprints or parcels or demographic data, we can think more broadly about the urban form and urban living in it, household access to jobs, to schools, and to stores to meet daily living needs. Transport planning has restructured these street networks over time. And as it's done so, it's redistributed access and equity in different ways for different groups. Now, transport planning has studied networks in their form for decades. There have been normative theories of street network form and design for centuries. But today, we're able to evaluate these spatial outcomes of transport plans in new ways, using new tools from network science and computation, all in that urban informatics toolkit. And that's allowed us to pursue a lot of interesting um, new directions recently at that intersection of informatics, network science, and urban mobility. That explosion of recent urban data and new modeling methods have unlocked several new paths of empirical and, and theoretical development. I wanna briefly just think about um, a few different directions here and some different folks who have been operating in that space um, and, and doing pretty novel work. So first off, there's been a, a lot of interesting work in rethinking accessibility, broadly considered. 
So folks like David Levinson, thinking about different ways to theorize access, different ways to measure it across urban space, specifically constraining traveler to the network. Um, new measures of topology and centrality in a network, thinking about how different characteristics of access are then distributed throughout the network based on its structural characteristics. There's been a lot of research on network design to try to relieve traffic congestion using streams of congestion data to try to understand its correlations with different kinds of um, historical network designs. Um, Chris Barrington Lee and Adam Millard Ball have, have done some really interesting work recently on global street network sprawl, using OpenStreetMap to look um, globally at trends towards sprawl where it's greater or lesser, to try to scorecard sustainability and planning. And then, of course, micro simulation, uh, which has been a, a longstanding method in regional science, has seen a lot of development too in, in recent years around integrated transport land use models as we're able to work with bigger, faster computers, more data sets to try to get richer and richer representations of travel and land use. And then secondly, um, new transport technologies. So autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, ride sharing, bike sharing, um, all will use these kind of network models in that informatics landscape to study mobility. Um, folks like Marta Gonzalez at UC Berkeley have done a lot of work uh, with GPS traces to understand the flows of people, and the pulse and metabolism of the city. Um, in this urban tech space, folks have used network models to solve optimization problems, um, do new forms of routing on a massive scale, demand prediction, um, optimization around service levels, fleet utilization. Then the, the third point here around machine learning, um, obviously an important frontier in any discussion of, of informatics and data science. And uh, urban mobility has obviously um, been no exception to that. In recent years, researchers have, have used these kinds of models to predict traffic flows with deep spatio-temporal um, residual neural networks. They've used convolutional autoencoders to analyze network structure, recurrent neural networks to reproduce um, empirical vehicular mobility pattern data, and quantum annealers for traffic flow optimization on quantum computing hardware which um, I think is going to be a, a particular area of, of innovation over the coming decade. But um, what I'd like to talk about for a, a few minutes here is quantitative urban morphology, which is the, the niche in this space in which I do much of my work and where there's been a, a particular blossoming of methods and findings um, over the past five or so years. So quantitative urban morphology employs quantitative methods to study the physical form and the evolving spatial structure of cities. It particularly does so through its street networks, parcels, and, and buildings. This is a, a typically descriptive science, but it's central to our understanding of mobility and access. So the kind of forms that allow us to move through space and the combination of origins and destinations that determine when, why, and how we move through space. In recent years, um, this field has faced a fundamental challenge though, to expand beyond its traditional individual case studies and small samples to extend its theoretical innovations more universally. And that's kind of a clarion call that we see a lot of the time for urban informatics being applied in traditional fields moving beyond those smaller sample, smaller scale studies to try to speak more broadly about cities rather than 10 cities in the UK or a 30 city study in the US. What can we say more broadly about cities and urban living? So here it's been assisted by larger samples and more data, new algorithms and tools, and new empirical findings on urban circulation networks. So it's just one example of that. Um, I spoke about OpenStreetMap briefly earlier, which is a public mapping platform and a, a worldwide geospatial database. Uh, this is the information resource, which I use probably the most frequently. I'm the developer of a Python package called OSMNX, 
which allows us to download any geospatial data from OSM and um, model spatial networks for urban analyses. Uh, we can plug in different place names, cities, neighborhoods, boroughs, county, states, nations, quickly build a, a graph theoretic model that conforms to um, our theoretical understandings and transport planning, and then quickly run lots of different analyses on them. We can model elevation data um, to understand street grades, sea level rise, and what kind of communities it will impact, whose transport infrastructure will be interrupted. And we can develop better impedance functions to model active transportation in new ways by taking changes in elevation um, into account as a three-dimensional geometry that represents a street network rather than too often relying on traditional two-dimensional geometric models. Um, some open questions that have uh, recently been answered here revolve around our progress toward more sustainable mobility trying to benchmark and scorecard different spatial outcomes, and then extending our theoretical insights more universally to understand mobility networks around the world. So in, in the US context, you know, after a, a century of shaping American cities around the spatial logic of the car, planners today have been struggling to address crises of climate change, um, public health crises of physical inactivity, environmental pollution that I'm um, enjoying today as I look out my window at what will be a gorgeous day outside. Over the past 25 years or so, planning scholars and prominent um, practitioner groups have highlighted the links between transport network form and all of these crises, calling for a return to traditional land use patterns, um, street network designs, like um, the more fine-grained street grid that allow active travel, greater freedom of mode choice. But a, a key question in this space has remained, how is planning practice responding to those calls from scholars and, and prominent advocacy groups? So in some of my recent work, uh, I've modeled the street networks of the entire US at multiple scales, looking at every city, urban area, county, tract, and Zillow neighborhood, calculated um, a couple dozen indicators for each, and then made those models and indicators available online um, for other people to work with. But um, so in some of my own empirical work with these models, I tried to look at that question of understanding what planning has wrought. So benchmarking planning outcomes, and then trying to look over time at a scorecard towards sustainability. Are we moving in the right direction? So here we can see, um, the census tract in the contiguous US. And I've shaded them here by their grid index value. So griddedness varies drastically around the world. And this isn't a good measure necessarily everywhere, but it is a useful one in the US because of the spatial legacy of its 19th century expansion, which happened according to a gridded planning paradigm. So here I'm looking at the connectivity the compactness, the internal orientation of the street network is a proxy for its sustainability. That is, we know empirically these kind of spatial forms allow for more active travel when land use is amenable as well. So where does that exist or not exist today in the US? So here we can see that there are probably certain covariates, right? Um, for those familiar with US geography, we can see that topography likely plays a role more mountainous places um, like in the Appalachia, Rocky Mountains, Sierra Nevada um, are not grid-like, which makes perfect sense. It's hard to build compact grid-like networks um, where there's a lot of elevation change. But we might also suspect there's some relationship here with suburbanization, where a place like Chicago, for example, is very grid-like, but in its suburbs and exurbs, we see that it's a little bit less so. We might also suspect there might be something to do with era here, or places that were built at a certain time under a certain planning logic might exhibit different spatial forms, and we see um, in earlier or later periods. And we do see basically that. So these are uh, snapshots of characteristics today of networks built in different eras. 
where we've been able to scorecard the spatial outcomes of urban form that are planned over time. <clears throat> so in particular, we see this trend across many dimensions toward greater sprawl in the US from the post-war era through the 1990s, which conforms to our general understanding of what American planning um, was predicated on over those years, the logic of the car. But interestingly, we're starting to pick up somewhat of a reversal in the past two decades across multiple different dimensions toward more sustainable and more traditional forms where the networks are becoming a little bit denser, street lengths are becoming a little bit shorter, connectivity is greater, um, four-way intersection proportions, fewer dead ends. This is important for planning because network form lasts for centuries, we still see the vestiges of original network forms um, in old Roman empire cities to this day. When places like San Francisco burned down, we still get the same kind of street network after the fact because it's hard to undo those infrastructure paths and private property rights and land parcelization around them. So it's deeply important for planners to get network planning right the first time. Scorecarding these things is important to monitor our progress toward more sustainable forms, toward more freedom of mode choice. But this study was limited to the US. And increasingly, I think a lot of the action in this space is in more rapidly developing countries. So my current work here is trying to look at um, worldwide street network forms. And I think this is a direction where a lot of folks in, in urban informatics and mobility are, are going now, trying to look um, at rapidly developing countries where there's a much greater leverage point for these arguments about planning and spatial legacies in the urban form. So in my recent work here, um, I've been modeling the street network of every urban area in the world using boundaries derived from the global human settlement layer. Um, the global human settlement layer uses spatial data mining to organize vast amounts of, of information from satellite image streams, censuses, volunteer geographic information, and it delineates um, urban areas using these data <clears throat> and other scientific open data sources. So we have these new measures of where urban areas are or aren't, and we can then link those up with other similarly bounded um, covariates. So here I've um, modeled my networks using OpenStreetMap and OSMNX. I calculated um, elevations and grades for every urban area. And then I calculated a bunch of street network indicators for all these different places to conduct some analyses of their urban form. And in doing so, um, I've been able to estimate some different relationships across worldwide areas. So looking at some of these fundamental relationships that we talk about in, in urban studies and, and transport, but being able to look more broadly at what are these actual relationships if we look at every urban area in the world, that we can decompose those into different regions to try to understand um, how some of these elasticities might vary in different places. But here, for example, we can see that uh, intersection counts is positively associated with street length and able to relatively precisely estimate what that relationship is um, globally. Also, in interestingly, infrastructure scales sublinearly with population, which makes theoretical sense because um, increasing numbers of residents can share existing infrastructure. So a 1% increase in population I found is associated with a 0.9% increase in, in street length and a 0.95% increase in intersection count. So there's a, a slight, slight um, sublinear scaling going on there. And then lastly, um, Mean per capita street length is associated with um, per capita urban area GDP. So a $10,000 uh, increase in, in GDP per capita in that urban area is associated with a one meter increase in per capita street length. So this is a common measure of infrastructure accessibility to the population. That is places that are wealthier have greater economic productivity we see also tend to have more um, infrastructure accessibility. Now, this is not a causal model. So there could be endogeneity. Um, it could go in either direction. There could be other variables, but just the relationship between those two here. 
So these are um, promising but nascent trends toward more sustainable forms in places like the United States and some preliminary benchmarks and scorecards to understanding urban form around the world, giving us this sort of initial snapshot of, of urban scale networks, mobility, um, mobility infrastructure um, globally. Now, historically, our empirical and, and theoretical work in this space um, would often be hamstrung by methodological challenges. We still see that today. Usually methodological um, improvements can lead to some new empirical insight, either looking at more stuff or different stuff or being able to model a new relationship that was too hard to compute in the past. Because of that relationship here, in, in, that intersection of urban informatics and planning with its reliance on methodological innovation, <clears throat> um, I would argue that we have a central opportunity here to generate better tools for research and practice to understand and monitor and design better mobility networks. All of the preceding empirical work that I've been talking about um, has all been empowered by that ongoing iterative tool development. So I wanna conclude my chat with you today by reflecting on that a little bit <clears throat> as a path forward for us. And my argument here is that we need better tools to conduct better science. By better tools, what I mean is tools that better embody the appropriate theory. So infusing our tools with the relevant domain theory, that could be urban theory, geographic theory, transportation theory, but too often because our tools aren't developed by our theoreticians, they tend to have fairly impoverished representations of theory that we then try to shoehorn models into. We try to shoehorn data into to try to fit those models. And then we do our best to talk about the theoretical insights that come out of those analyses. I would argue that we need a better shared commons of software tools that are being led by academics who are well equipped to infuse those tools with theory tools that are well documented and reusable so that we don't always have to reinvent the wheel by developing our tools ad hoc for every new research article we want to write so that others who are studying the same kinds of things that we are don't have to reinvent the wheel we already developed but we filed it away in a desk drawer when we were done rather than publishing our code open source for others to reuse. And reuse, I think, is the key word here, because reusability goes a step beyond reproducibility or replicability, which um, are obviously key in modern scientific practice today, and they are very important, but reusability is one step further. So beyond being able to reproduce someone's study or being able to replicate it in other places. Reusability in science would mean that we have data that are out there for others to reuse once we've taken a crack at it. It means that the tools that we have developed are well documented enough for others to be able to reuse to do their own studies in a similar vein. And this is where that idea of a, a software commons for urban informatics comes into play. And there are both upstream and downstream benefits to participating in that commons. So upstream, as a participant, you receive the benefit of people contributing to your research tools, flowing back up into you as a tool developer. Downstream, other people get to use your research tools. So you're creating value for other folks downstream in that tool chain. And there's a huge opportunity here for advancing urban informatics and, and science in that mobility space, this idea of open source tooling. There's a very long lineage of this in regional science. And in fact, a, a lot of the stuff that's happening in this space now has its roots in, in regional science. Um, a few examples here, um, I've drawn largely from um, the Python ecosystem because that's in which I primarily operate, but there is a, a parallel set of tools being developed in the R ecosystem as well that, that are equally important. But toolkits like Geoda and Geoda Space that have um, been led by Luke Anselin for years, 
um, Serge Ray's Pi Sal, and it's very large and growing family of related tools and libraries for doing spatial science. Um, Urban Sim, which was developed by Paul Waddell to, do, uh, to try to integrate land use modeling and simulation with transport modeling and simulation. Um, Moving Pandas, a, a toolkit developed by Anita Grazer to try to build trajectories and flows into Pandas. And then um, OSMNX, I hope to contribute into this space as a, a tool of my own, which I've made open source for doing street network modeling and looking at crowdsourced geospatial data. But beyond this sort of hero model of a developer leading software development, there's an equally important decentralized many hands model in open source tooling. And that's community tool building where we collaborate around shared goals, including the all important routine maintenance and ongoing evolution of mature product projects um, that too often is disincentivized or, or underappreciated, particularly in academia, where we have misaligned incentives to be able to create all this value of open source theory rich tooling. So to conclude, um, there are some important opportunities here to blend informatics and transport planning and, and urban studies more broadly. Theory infused informatics, so that would be better representations of real world geometries, in three dimensions, or including the temporal dimension as well. Um, non planar topologies in our models and representations of more diverse geographies. So being able to bring informatics into the global south and thinking critically about what that means for its privacy dimensions, its ethical dimensions, it being used as a tool of suppression and control or a tool of emancipation and freedom and choice. Um, informatics tools for research. So new kinds of models for new kinds of data, making code and data broadly available, reducing our role as gatekeepers, pulling up the gangplanks when we've completed a study to allow for more reusable science. And then on the methods fronts, um, as we in this space continue to engage with high performance computing clusters, big data on infrastructure, GPU computing, being able to keep pushing that methodological envelope while always keeping in mind that theory building endeavor, keeping it a science rather than just a data analysis. And then on the professional front, having our tools be reusable for better transport practice. In addition, there's a parallel track of um, great innovation happening on in methods right now on, on the professional practice side, things like Esri's City Engine or Calthorpe's Urban Footprint, letting us understand network form in new ways, um, being able to simulate human movement through space in new ways. Um, and I, I believe it, at the end of the day, supporting the commons is going to be key to doing informatics for good because centering the commons helps us also center this idea of um, data gathered by the people, not just from the people. More tools for citizen science and advocacy for better connected and more sustainable urban mo mo mobility patterns. So um, I will leave it there. I'm happy to answer any questions with what time remains. And I'd like to thank you all for having me this morning. Yes, thank you very much, Jeff. So uh, please, everyone, do not hesitate to post your questions in the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to take them up as they uh, appear. Um, but as I haven't seen anything written right yet, I'm going to take the floor and just ask one of the questions I actually have. And I'm a planner, um, so my question stems, uh, you, you really uh, hit home with your description of those wicked uh, problems. Um, now I wonder if you've got an example um, where one of those wicked uh, problems could be solved by urban um, informatics or where you feel like there has been some really new model just to make it a bit more concrete with an example. Absolutely. I think one important way that urban informatics can help address wicked problems is by 
remembering that it is one tool in a broader toolkit. The problem with most wicked problems is that they can't just be solved by the technocracy. Especially in an open society, these are usually problems of an explicitly political nature. Things where we have um, incommensurate values and we have to make choices where factions will fundamentally want the opposite of each other. It do, it's not just a problem of more data, better models, a, a more advanced simulation um, on, on a bunch of GPUs to be able to solve those kinds of problems. The ways in which urban informatics can help there, I think, um, are through crowdsourced informatics, mm -hmm. from new ways of having people being able to engage with their city, and their planners, um, and new ways of visualizing and presenting information. So part of the work that I've tried to do is in visual communication mm -hmm. to help people understand comparative urban form in different ways, with the idea being that if we have a better understanding of what different places are like, it can help demystify some of these arguments around density, where it at least in the American context, it doesn't have to be this frightening um, UN takeover of our freedoms, but rather in reality, we're talking about making places slightly more like the kind of cities in which you enjoy vacationing because they're so pleasurable to spend time in mm. or to walk around a little bit. And I think if, if urban informatics can work as um, one arrow in the quiver, to help with visual communication or to help with um, a better simulation to have planners go into a planning meeting and, and work with the community. Those kind of methods tend to be a lot more effective than the urban informatics it takes the form of. We estimated a few econometric models and we have solved the city. Well, thank you very much. Uh, very insightful. So now we've got a question in the chat by Michael Glas and Michael Glas, and he's he asks, NSF is currently interested in AI and ML information tools. The Fairness and AI Research Program acknowledges that AI ML may reproduce social inequalities. Do you share their concerns for how these tools are used for transportation analysis? And before you do, would you just... Uh, do me the favor, and for those who are not um, as, uh, as used to all the uh, ab abbreviations, um, just introduce them as far as you know them, of course. Yeah, so that is specifically AI and, and ML? Yes. Yeah, so um, AI would refer to artificial intelligence, and ML would refer to machine learning. Um, and so the, the question is, is about this proposition that these kinds of technologies would reproduce some of the traditional problems that we've seen in society. So reproducing forms of, of segregation or reproducing um, disadvantage, privilege and, and power in society. Um, I suppose I, I would agree with the NSF, but I don't think they've taken that argument far enough. So I would only disagree with them in that sense. Where I think beyond reproducing these things, what these technologies tend to do more often is amplify them. And we've seen that throughout history. When humans develop new tools, they're rarely used to allow us to do the same thing the same way, but rather to make it more efficient, to be able to weaponize the, all the worst aspects of human nature. And we've absolutely seen that in, in AI and ML from examples like um, Facebook and, and what it did in, in the US election and disinformation spreading um, to policing where we estimate and fit and train our, our policing prediction models on places where there have been prior arrests. Well, those places where there have been prior arrests are usually marginalized communities in which there's been a history of over-policing um, and a, a, a rush to make arrests in, in our black and brown communities. It doesn't happen in, in our white communities. When we use those data to predict where to police next and where to divert those resources, guess what happens? You get a feedback loop and those feedback loops amplify themselves. Mm -hmm. If we apply those same technologies to transport, we're going to see the same kinds of things. And if we treat algorithms as these neutral technocratic black boxes where we'll remove the planner from the equation because they're biased, we'll let the algorithm decide, we're going to see all the biases coming in from the algorithm that was created by a human being just like any urban plan ever was. So I think beyond be, being cautious about the reproduction of social harm, 
we should be doubly cautious about the amplification of, of social harm. Thank you, Jeff. The next question in the chat is from Oliver Herman. He asks, how can these tools and indicators be used to drive, understand economic growth and the jobs in rapidly urbanizing, in brackets, developing country environments? Who is doing interesting research in this area? Um, yeah, that, that's a good question. I, there's been a lot of research happening in this area, and it sounds like there are two aspects there you're thinking about, both the economic development side of it in terms of jobs, and secondly, the, the spatial form side of it in terms of what kind of built environment we're building, the kinds of connectivity networks and the kinds of buildings that, that we're building. So these tools and indicators can help us understand parts of that, other tools and indicators can help us understand other parts of it. Nothing can help us understand all of it if we're focusing on, on quantifying because not all of these things are quantifiable. In terms of um, some of the tools that I, I was talking about today, what we're able to do for the first time now is comparative analyses um, across lots of different cities around the world. So no longer a bespoke toolkit mm -hmm. for being able to model um, British networks or German networks or American networks or Chinese networks, but being able to say that we have a harmonized set of data with a consistently meaningful representation that we can model consistently using a single toolkit to be able to understand how different people in, in different places live. That's really important in a place like China, where we don't have good sources of government information about um, what networks are being built? Where is urbanization happening? So we rely more heavily on um, satellite imagery, on, on um, crowdsourced data like OpenStreetMap to try to build those kinds of models. Um, and China is a good example because I, I mentioned it briefly in, in my talk, but that's where a lot of the action is in these rapidly urbanizing places that are undergoing rapid development right now. Mm -hmm. um, as planners, we have a much greater leverage point for making impact in those places because of the very long legacy um, and, and path dependence of, of urban form and particularly street networks. And I think that goes into that second part of your question around the economic development and, and jobs angle. Those are different kinds of data than urban form data are, but they're equally important because that's how we model commutes. Um, commutes don't usually make up the majority of trips, at least not in, in the US context, I, I can't speak to everywhere, but they make up an important part of trips and particularly our, our long trips. So being able to infuse jobs and homes data into these models is really important for understanding the flow side hmm. on the form side. Thank you. And just looking at the time, so um, the next question actually also is uh, lends itself for a quite short answer. So um, Sibom Song is uh, first of all thanking you for the presentation and is then asking, is there any projects that is initiated by citizens and users to solve their daily problems by using information? And this uh, nicely links to your call really to contribute to the commons. So is there any bottom up initiative that you would like to pinpoint us to? Yeah, I mean, there certainly has been. The, the challenge is defining what bottom up really means. So we can point to a lot of hackathons that happen in cities where we'll bring you know, a couple of computer scientists or coders into a room, have them sit down with planners and have a bunch of citizens come in and take part you know, try to um, try to elicit the local people's preferences to understand how things should be. And so those often take the form of developing um, new citizen engagement dashboards. Um, in the US, we have a lot of 311 systems where we're, we're moving online from being able to report if there's a pothole or a fallen tree or a noise complaint, stuff like that. Um, and several of those have been developed hands-on um, with um, individual members of the public. But I'm not sure if that's necessarily bottom up, though, because these spaces are almost always being mediated by someone from the city and by people with technical skills. And so there are going to be certain filters and biases that get brought into that. But I think that those kinds of um, integrated cooperative events 
are a good model for how a lot of this can be done. The challenge being self-selection biases of who shows up to these kinds of things and whose voices get heard um, in those rooms. Mm -hmm. And we have some ways of, of working around that and trying to have more plural society represented in those events, but it's, it's not perfect. So um, speaking about plural societies, a very final answer came in, and that's the question about what is the availability of the data for the global south and can it be replicated for research uh, in the area? So, I mean, that's quite a, a big uh, question, so we might not be able to answer it in great tips, but maybe you can just uh, suggest uh, some pointers. Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll try to do the 30 second version of, it, of the answer. Um, data in the global south is far worse than it is in the global north. It depends on the kind of question you're asking and where you're looking. If you're looking at big cities and street networks, we tend to now have pretty good and consistent data um, around the world. If you're looking at specific connectivity, you might have a worse topological model in the global south. If you're looking at a pedestrian path through park, you will have less of that kind of data in the global south. So. Um, it's incumbent on all of us as users of these data, as developers, as academics, as students, as citizens, to contribute to those data commons and those tool commons to fill those data gaps so everyone can ask better questions and um, so that we can um, work with and, and for the Global South more than we have historically. Well, Jeff, many thanks for a very comprehensive talk. Um, that was uh, very easy to follow and um, really think about the big questions of today. Johannes Moser has uh, just, uh, I think, given a comment and uh, where he, I think, would like to give you some uh, ideas as well, which is uh, that he says, thank you so much for providing us with OSM Annex. I'm very much looking forward to extensions and updates. So you've got some tasks to let your hand. In case of large covered areas, it would be great to find an easier way of gaining a connected network that leaves out some minor streets to save memory. But I see that this is more an OSM problem than an OSMNX problem. And I'm, I'm very happy to see that already there's some uh, communication going on about um, the next uh, steps of developing uh, the commons um, more. Absolutely. Uh, and I think this is a really important, uh, well, maybe this is just really a very good final comment that was been made in this context. So again, many thanks, Jeff. Many thanks as well to RSA for organizing this year's um, annual lecture series that really showcases uh, some of the up-to-date and important work that's going on in the academic community and thinking about the time arrangements that allow um, the talks to be accessible across different uh, time zones. Many thanks to everyone who has participated today. Um, as I know, some of you are in very odd uh, time zones at this point in time. So thanks for taking the time to tuning in for everyone um, who you think would be interested in this talk. It will be made available on the RSA uh, launch. So you are also able to re-watch uh, the lecture online. So before we... Uh, leave it for today. I would like to also make an announcement for the last uh, lecture of this year's annual lecture series by the RSA, which is for the journal Territory Politics and Governance, and it will be happening actually this Friday at 12 o'clock UK time, so you need to translate wherever in your time zones um, this is, and it will be held by Julian A. Agumen, Agumen, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name right, but until Friday, the share will have uh, identified how to pronounce it correctly, and it will be on just um, sustainabilities and the politics that are uh, going on there. So again, a very fundamental topic that will be covered. So for today, many thanks again to everyone, and I wish you a very good day, and I see everyone on Friday, and wish you a good bye. <laughs>